Good morning. Today, Pastor Peter Chin will share the message from Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 through 39, and Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. I will read in Enyuani Ibo, and Seneca will read in English. Hear the word of the Lord. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, unu wa nebu onye ozi chineken na. Unu wa na tumbulu nonye ozi chineken na. Epo ka magam omwa kunu di ka okuku si achuku ama umu aka nke ya mana unu ekwene. Uno bu unu di nonye. Uno ama fuzim ozo dialiso nuno kwe na chineke na bueze. Uno a biaji ono nuku na ngazi dili afa chineke na. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Luke 19, 41 through 44. Oge di nwene anyi Bia we anya ofu kodi obe akwa ba anyi mili oba siwa. Na udo na gefe liwe mana na nwe gene nge. Nwe wele no nanya enyi. Oba na gawa patrufu anya no fu mbosi. Indi oshi. Indi iwe ga bia na liwe obodo we. Ga hu me we. Po luwe ba poluzukwe. Umuwa maka na wa manya oge di wene enyi jebaha baha gefe liwe. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what you, would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children, within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of the Lord. With that, I do want to get into our sermon for this morning. Uh, we have just started off a sermon series which we're calling A God Who Grieves. And what we're doing is we're looking at the stories of Lent and the stories of Passion Week, and we're looking at the various moments in which we see grief or mourning taking place, because there's actually quite a few of them, that the Lent stories are marked by a lot of grief. And so it's a very powerful way for us to kind of re-examine those stories and to go through these stories that we know so well, but through a lens that we may not have done before, which is the grief that we, we find in those passages. The other reason that we're doing that is because grief is all around us. There are so many people who have lost loved ones, and not even if you haven't lost someone, I think there's just a sense of grief and loss that many of us are experiencing. And so we're going through the sermon series not only to explore the scripture, but also so that we might bring this reality before God. That it might not be something that we isolate from God, but instead that we feel God is walking alongside of us in those experiences and through those feelings as well. Today, as we talk about this very first moment when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem and the, the grief that he feels there, there's a lot of different points that come out of it. And so I encourage you to take kind of the ones that impact you the most and kind of chew on them. But we're going to kind of bounce around from point to point. So uh, just kind of try to keep track the best you can as you go through this. But one thing I did want to point out about um, the passage that was read by Onya and by uh, Seneca this morning is that this moment that we read in Scripture is the moment where we see Jesus' anger most clearly in his entire ministry. Because what Jesus says right before the passage in Matthew that we just read is that he goes off on the Pharisees. And he has this list of woes, these invectives that he throws out there to the Pharisees, one of which is this from verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. I, I said that because that's like the way in which I think Jesus spoke it. You can't say these words nicely. 
There is no polite way to read those passages. Jesus is flamingly angry in this moment. He's incredibly outraged by how the Pharisees have conducted themselves as the leaders of the people of Israel. We find the same exact thing happening in the other passage that we find in the book of Luke. Because right after the passage that we just read, this is what Jesus does. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it in a den of robbers. As an illustration of his anger, other passages tell us that he actually makes a whip out of rope, a cord, and he begins to whip the sellers out of this place of worship, which was designated for the Gentiles to be able to worship. This was not a place of commerce. It was a place where Gentiles, who were not able to go to the inner courts, were supposed to be worshiping God. And instead, they were uh, around livestock and hearing prices for, for animals being uh, shouted out instead. So these passages that we just read are passages about anger, about Jesus' anger most, uh, most clearly displayed. And I want to make a quick, po uh, quick point based off this, and that is this. Anger is a powerful emotion that God has given us that may lead us to sin, but is not a sin in itself. Why I think that's important to make, it might seem like an obvious kind of thing to say, is that I don't know if it's just me, but I grew up being taught and told that anger is kind of like a sin. It's a bad thing. You shouldn't be angry. If you're angry, you're doing something wrong. And Christians don't get angry. We're peaceful, we're joyful, we're happy, and that's the way that we should be conducting ourselves, but we should not get angry. But here we have Jesus himself, the Son of God, who never sins, being angry. And I think this is a simple reminder to us that anger is not a sin. That it's God himself who has given us the capacity to become angry and to feel angry. And I think that pushes back on this very subtle teaching that we have kind of internalized that anger is a sin. It is not a sin. Yes, it's true what Paul says, that it can lead us to sin, and that we should be careful not to sin in our anger, but that's a, different, that's a different thing from anger itself being the problem. Anger can be righteous. It can be appropriate as well. And I think this is a good, important, brief reminder to us that there is a place for anger. There is also the, the realization that there can be too much anger, and I think that's something that we see all around us. But at the same time, we shouldn't go so far as to think that anger itself is a sin. As we go further in this, this is the moment in which Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, and he's kind of... Uh, People think that he's becoming this great prophet or even the king of Israel. And the first thing that he does is he begins to let go on the Pharisees and he drives people out of the temple courts in anger. And I'm sure as people are watching this, they're thinking, why is this guy so angry? Why is he so mad in this moment? And they're trying to understand this. And we begin to realize what his anger is really about, that these passages that we read about, about anger, are actually passages about Jesus' grief. Read what we see in Luke chapter 19. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. This anger that we read about in Matthew and Luke are not just Jesus being angry, being an angry guy. It comes out of his grief. It comes out of him looking at the people of Jerusalem and recognizing how far they are from God's plans and God's purposes, how they refuse to see the people that God is sending and the plans that God is enacting. And he's so grieved by this. And an expression of that grief is anger. It's not a separate quality. It's not a separate emotion. But that grief is being expressed through that anger. And this teaches us something really crucial about grief, and that is this. Although we often think of them as being separate emotions, anger is a common and natural expression of grief. I think we have this tendency to kind of separate and make all of our emotions very distinct from one another. I think about the movie Inside Out. You guys have seen that animated movie. Uh, this young girl has all these emotions. All these emotions are different characters, kind of separate voices, separate things ultimately, very different from one another. And so I think we get that impression. I'm sad or I'm happy or I'm angry. I can only feel one of these things at a time. And so we have a tendency to kind of perceive our emotions in this way, that I only can feel one thing at any moment in time. But I think what we see in today's passage is that it's not really always the case. That at least when it comes to grief, 
Grief can be expressed through anger, and sometimes our anger comes directly out of that grief. They're really connected to one another. And so that gives a different understanding of our grief. Grief is not just sadness. It's not just when I feel bad about something. It can even be the things you're angry about as well. It's a natural expression of what grieves you. And in fact, that is why in some of the, uh, and how we understand the processing of grief and the five stages of grief, one of them is anger. It's a very natural expression of it. And so I think connecting our grief to our anger gives us a fuller understanding of our grief and where it is going. But I think there's another practical dimension of this that's really important, and that is this. There is a subtle but important difference between just being angry and being grieved. You see, if we see anger and grief as completely separate things, when we see people who are acting one way, we have a tendency to see them in that one emotion. So if someone is angry, we look at them, and again, we think about it as a separate emotion. You can only feel this one emotion at the time. We look at them and we think, why are they so angry? Why is that person so angry? And we kind of limit our understanding of that person to that emotion. It's pathological. It's personal. They're just an angry person. That's all that it is. But if we recognize, like we just read today, that anger is not isolated, that sometimes it comes out of a deeper story or deeper experience, we could be saying something very different, a very subtle kind of turn on that phrase. We can say, why are they so angered? Why are they so grieved? And in that, we are acknowledging that their pain or their their anger is not just a thing into itself. It's not just a personality trait. It came from something. It's from an experience that they've had. There's a difference between someone being pathologically angry all the time and someone being angered because something has happened to them. And I think a powerful way in which I began to realize this is that I used to look at people who used to protest things as just being angry. I mean, look at their faces. Look at the fists when they're raising. Look at they're marching down the street obstructing traffic. Why are they so angry? Why are they so mad all the time? But when you begin to realize that anger is not just a thing to itself, but it flows from somewhere else, I began to ask a different question, which is, why are they angry? What are they angered by? And I began to realize that I had friends who were worried about going out in public or their children walking down the street or whether it would happen if a police officer pulled them over. I began to realize that's why they're angry. They're not angry because it's a, a DNA condition, a pathology that they possess, They are legitimately angry about something, about a reality that they're experiencing. And now you see why it's so important that we go beyond separating our emotions. It's not just an eternal practice. It's not just something that helps us understand our internal states better. It actually helps us to understand one another better. That the more we recognize that there is a connection between our grief and our anger, the better we see each other as well, which is hugely important at this time. This is huge stuff seeing the connection between anger and grief. But that is not even the full arc of the connections between these emotions. Because these passages in which you see Jesus' anger, where you're really seeing Jesus' grief, is really where you're seeing Jesus' love. In Matthew 23, verse 37, look at how Jesus describes his emotions in this moment and how he feels about the people of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. I can't really think of a more tender expression you could say to people than I wish I could just hug you and gather you up to myself. This is Jesus' ultimate motivation. He loves the people of Jerusalem. He loves these people despite what they're doing, despite what they fail to recognize, despite how they will treat him. He loves them. And because of that love, he is grieved by what they will do. And he is angered as well. But they're all connected to one another. As you read about Jesus' entry into this moment, you're reading about all of these things. These aren't just passages about anger. Neither are they just passages about grief or just love. You're seeing how all these things are so blended. They are so blended, you can't even tell one apart from the other. This gives us a totally different way of us defining and understanding the grief that we see around us or we experience in our own lives. 
Understanding grief means going beyond seeing it as an isolated emotion and understanding where it comes from and the different ways it gets lived out. If you're seeing grief or you're feeling grief, I think one way that we can come to grips and, and process it more fully is don't just look at your grief. Don't just think about your sadness. Realize that it's not an individual character in a movie. I think a better way to visualize grief in our lives, grief is like a river. And actually, I think there's a famous poem which is called, My Grief is Like a River. There is no part of a river, right? You can't say, oh, the river is this section from this section, or it's this part from this part, or it's this bend in this curve. A river is all of that. A river is its source. A river where it goes out. A river is all the spaces in between. So it is with our grief. Our grief is our love. It comes from our love. Our grief is our anger and our pain. All of that is grief. And if we want to understand grief, we have to look at the whole river, not simply just one section of it. I think what that means is that when we ask questions to understand our grief, we can go before and after, deeper, higher, when we ask those questions. We can ask questions like, what am I grieving in my life, right? That's the most basic question when it comes to grief. What, what, why am I grieving? What am I grieving? Which I think is a great question. But again, we can't stop there. We can go further and say, how does my grief reveal what I love? Have you ever thought about that? That maybe the things you're grieving is actually telling you you love that thing or that person a lot. And you never realized it before. But your grief is telling you the things that you love in your life. Or you could ask the question, what am I angry about? And after times, we wouldn't connect our anger to our grief. We would say, oh, it's separate. I'm mad about that. Maybe it's not. Maybe the things that you are outraged about and you're grieving and you're angry about is actually telling you what you grieve about and actually what you love as well. How might your anger actually be an expression of your grief? And these are very different questions of grief that we usually wouldn't ask ourselves. We wouldn't talk about our love. We wouldn't talk about our anger. But with these questions, we can go deeper. We can understand the full river rather than just one part of it. So I think this connection between these things and seeing um, um, this moment in Scripture in this way gives us a far more accurate and deep understanding of the feelings that we might have. But there's something else that I find happening in these passages which I think is very powerful and that the passages that we just talk about highlight an overlooked aspect of Jesus' love. They kind of illustrate a part, a way in which Jesus loves us that I actually don't think I hear talked about very often. What Jesus is doing in these two passages that we just read, he's actually prophesying. He's not just getting mad. He's prophesying about the future. Because what he is talking about when he's talking about people being thrown from walls and, and these embankments being built is that in 70 A.D., the Roman army will respond to a Jewish revolt and they will come and they will level the city of Jerusalem under General Titus. He's predicting what will happen in a few short decades from then. That's what these are. These are prophecies about the destruction of Jerusalem. And as he prophesies about the destruction of Jerusalem, what he's doing at the same time is he's making very clear that it's the responsibility of the people of Jerusalem. Everything that is going to happen to them is really their own fault. And he makes it crystal clear. In Luke 19, he says this, The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Everything that will happen is because you fail to recognize that God's peace was right there with you in the person of Jesus. He says something similar but different in Matthew. He says, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So he says, everything that is going to happen is because the people that God sent to you to be peace, you killed them and you oppressed them. And this is your fault. Everything that is going to happen, 
That has happened when Babylon destroyed you before and when Rome will destroy you in the future is because you failed to recognize who was being sent and you killed those people like in the parable of the vineyard. He makes this crystal clear. Now you would assume because he sees this as Jerusalem's fault that Jesus' attitude would be one of contempt. It'd be one that says, this is on you. You did this to yourself. You have no one to blame, O oh people of Jerusalem, except for yourselves, because this is your responsibility. But instead, what do we find Jesus' heart being revealed in this passage? But as he approaches Jerusalem and sees the city, he weeps. He doesn't come looking and saying, you, you deserve everything you get. He cries because he knows what is going to happen, and he imagines it. He visualizes it in his prophetic mind, and he cries because of what is going to take place. He looks at these people, and he says, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Even as he knows everything that is going to happen is their own responsibility, his heart breaks for their pain at the same time. This is a demonstration of a unique, overlooked way in which Jesus loves all of us. Jesus' love for us is such that he still grieves for our pain, even if we may have brought that pain upon ourselves. Think about that for your own lives. There are people in your life who, even when you screw up and you know that everything you're experiencing, all the pain and all the suffering, all the alienation is really because of you and your pigheadedness or my stubbornness or just being angry or whatever it might be. And we know it's our responsibility and it's all on us. There are certain people, hopefully in our lives, who still their heart breaks for us. They still look at us in the moments where we are at our very worst and they're not like, sorry, you did this to yourself. You have no one to blame but yourself. But in those moments where we're getting what we deserve, all they feel is mourning for us. They don't care that it's our fault. They don't care that it's our responsibility. They see our pain, and that is all that they see. And they say, I feel so bad for you. I am so sorry this is happening in your life. They don't even mention the fact it's our responsibility. And sometimes they could be the ones suffering from it, even worse. They could be in direct line of fire of what we have done, and they will still love us because we are in pain. That is a wonderful kind of love if you have experienced it before, and it is precisely how God loves each one of us. This is not the only moment that we see this dimension of God's love. In Ezekiel chapter 33, it says this, Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? We're wasting away. We've done something wrong and, and we're being punished for this. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in that. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn! Turn from your ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? As the people of Israel confess, we're broken because of our sin. We're suffering because of our sin. God says, don't sin anymore. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, you did this to yourself. He says, I take no pleasure in that. I don't find joy in this. Get out of there. Stop that. Come to me. That's all that he says. Where is there a better example of this but in Luke 23, where Jesus is on the cross suffering for the actions of other people? And what do we find him doing? Pronouncing judgments? Cursing the people around him? He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When we are at our very worst, when everything that we are experiencing is because of us, Jesus will intercede for us. He will always be brokenhearted for our pain even if we may have brought that pain upon ourselves. I don't know how many times I've ever heard God's love being expressed like that. He provides for us. He loves us. I've never thought about the idea that even when I screw up, that he would still grieve because I've screwed up. And he'll never stop doing that. He'll never stop grieving for the pain that I feel, even if I've brought that upon myself. This does a couple of powerful things. On a personal level, Understanding that this is the way God loves us paves the way for us to go back to God after we've done that wrong. Knowing that we have a God who doesn't just sit there with his arms folded saying, see, told you. 
or wag his finger at us. Instead, he just, his heart breaks because our heart is broken, makes it that much easier to go back to him. That's why it says in Romans 2, 4, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? He does that for the very reason that we would go back to him. Well, the father of the lost son, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and what? Crossed his arms? Said, you screwed up. No. He was filled with compassion for him, ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. If we can internalize this understanding of God, if we can believe this perception of God's love to our very core, it makes it so much easier just to turn around and go right back to him. And so that's why I think it's so important that we begin to see God in this way. When we are hurt, even if we've done that to ourselves, he will just be grieving. That will be his heart. And we can always go right back to him because that is his heart. And I think that's a powerful encouragement to us. But there's one more dimension of this love that we have to wrestle with. And that is to understand this. This is not just a way that God loves us, but a way that we are to love others. Because in John 13, 34 to 35, he says this, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So this is not simply a characteristic of God, that when people suffer for their own actions, God will never stop grieving for them. It's supposed to be something that we do for each other. It is something that we express to other people. And so the challenge that we have to confront today is, can the world say the same thing about us? Will the world experience the same thing from us as Jesus' followers? And why I think this is so important is because this is the opposite way of which our society is going. Our culture and our world is heading very much in the opposite direction. We become so polarized politically, theologically, geographically, in every possible sociological dimension that we have, that the more that that happens, the more that someone screws up on the opposite side of the spectrum, the less compassion that we feel for that person, and the more temptation there is to look at that person and be very smug, and even find a perverse kind of joy in the fact that they're suffering for the choices that we know they shouldn't have made. We feel it and we sense it all around us. As we read in the paper that this is happening to this person or this person is experiencing something else, it is harder and harder to feel compassion upon those people. And easier and easier for us to instead rejoice in what they're going through. That's the way our culture is going and I don't know the end of it, honestly. I don't think there is an end that I can predict because if a faceless pandemic could not allow us to realize that we had some other enemy, what will? This wasn't even a war where there was a human face. It's a, a faceless pathogen. And yet we found enemies in one another. The world is stampeding in that direction of polarization and contempt for one another. And so that's the way the world is going. And so how will we treat one another instead? I began to really question this in myself when our sister Romanita preached a couple of weeks ago. Romanita, who coincidentally is the new president and CEO of the Murdoch Foundation, just want to throw that out there, right? She still has to preach here, but she also is the president of the Murdoch Foundation. She said something really interesting. She said how people are kind of rejoicing in the fact that unvaccinated people die at higher rates because they do. Epidemiologically speaking, people who are unvaccinated do die at much higher rates. And she said that people are finding joy, or at the very least, a lack of compassion for these people who are leaving families behind, children behind, children who are dying. And there's kind of like, well, you made your own choices. And I thought to myself, how do I feel about this? What, what is the state of my heart? And I can almost feel myself stepping away from their humanity and begin to kind of buy into this world's perception. I'm sorry, you could have made better choices. You could have done something different. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. How often do we say that nowadays? Everywhere we go, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. It's a code word for saying, I should be compassionate, but I'm not. I should feel bad, but I don't. 
This is what the world is doing. We have to realize that is not the way that Jesus loves us. When we screw up, we suffer for our own kind of experiences. God's heart never stops breaking. He never loses that soft heartedness towards us. He never loses that sense of compassion. And neither should we. When people around us are suffering for whatever they've done, they're criminals or they've made terrible choices in their life, we need to remain soft hearted to them. Because one measure of our ability to love like Christ is to remain soft hearted to the suffering of others, even if self inflicted. If we cannot do so, then we cannot say that we are loving others as Christ loves us. If we can't look at someone who is screwed up because of something they have done in whatever capacity it is and say, I feel terrible for them. I feel badly that they're in jail. I feel badly that they're on ventilator. And not I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. But I am truly sorry for their family and for everything that they have gone through and experienced to get them to this point. Then we are not loving in the way that Christ loves us. We have to realize our model and our command doesn't come from this world. It doesn't come from social media. The way that we speak, the way that we love, and our social prompts and our conversation do not come from this world. We don't say to people, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. We do what Christ does. This is a command from our Lord and commander. That word, kyrios, is the same word in Greek for general and Lord. Our general has told us this is a way that we love. We simply say, I'm sorry for you. And we leave it at that. I want to challenge each one of us today with that. Yes, to internalize this, the love of God that never stops breaking for each one of us in our lives. But let's do that for the world. That the world might see what the love of Jesus is like in each one of their lives as well. Let's just sit with that for a moment. If the worship team, you could come up at this time. Let's just let those two things kind of sit with us for a moment. First off, that we would allow this perception of God's love to just sink in. No matter what you do, God's heart will never stop breaking for you or for me. I can do terrible things and suffer as a result of it, and God will weep over me. That is one dimension of his love. And just for a moment, just allow that to speak to you. Allow that to transform your visualization, your understanding of God. And at the same time as you receive that, recognize the words, the command of Jesus in John chapter 13. As I have loved you, love one another. By this, the world will know me. The world will know my love. The world will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. Just let the words of our Lord, our curios, our general, sit with you this morning. Let it convict you and me that as we step out into this world, the world needs to know what the love of God looks like. God, do this in each one of us today. Change our understanding of who you are, of your love, to add in this amazing dimension. Your heart never stops breaking for us. But in addition to this, God, help us remember we are to do this for others. Our heart cannot stop breaking for the suffering in this world. We confess, God, and our heart breaks for people who are on ventilators in COVID, regardless of if they've been vaccinated or unvaccinated. Our hearts break for those who are dying in Ukraine and Kiev, whether they are Ukrainian or Russian. What do we care about where they're from? What do we care about the choices that they've made? You don't. So why do we, God? Why do we care? We care because the world told us we should pick a side and we should rejoice in the death of our enemies. And you told us to do the exact opposite. So we commit ourselves as your disciples to loving the world in the way you have loved us. Empower us to be your love everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.